morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Rick, thanks uh, for you joining us this morning. I thought because of the theme of the Humanities Festival being this whole idea of the animal, we would split our conversation into two parts, and we would talk about Rick, the human animal, and then animals. <laughs> How does that sound? I, I'm pulling out my animalistic <laughs> tendencies now. Okay, yes. Well, let's start with you are actually a very fit human being, and I'm curious about your exercise regimen, and I know it must be hard. We were just talking about your travel schedule <clears throat> and how much you're traveling, but yeah. what is your daily workout? How do you maintain such a... Well, it's kind of an thing? interesting thing because most people, when they think about chefs and, and the, old, the old image of a chef was the big old fat guy wearing the big tall hat and all that sort of stuff. And um, that's really not pretty much the image that I see amongst all of my chef colleagues these days. Um, people are much more interested in, in um, taking care of themselves, most of the chefs that I know. And I'm certainly, I certainly fall into that category. Um, I'm big into yoga. That's the thing that's right for me. Um, when you work in a restaurant, um, it's, there's a lot of, it's a very pressured environment. And to me, um, I got into yoga almost 20 years ago now. And it, what I, I found that it was, the reason I found it was right for me was because it did two different things. Number one, it gave me flexibility, and number two, it gave me strength. And if you use those as metaphors, um, those are what you need to get through life, is, uh, strength, is strength and flexibility. Um, I uh, practice very seriously, and I practice every day. How long? Um, it anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour and a half. This morning I practiced an hour and a half because this is my day off. So it was, uh, I, I got a little bit more, more time in. But when I say 15 minutes, it's because um, I've made the commitment to practice every day. And some days, you know, things just don't work out like you expect them to. And so I find I can always carve out 15 minutes. And just taking the time to go to the mat and to breathe deeply and to get out of my head and to stretch my body out and do something that, is, that, 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 that involves strength um, and balance a lot of times. I, I think you could imagine from my introduction <laughs> that um, sometimes it would be easy for me to get out of balance in my life. So I do a lot of balance stuff. I'm really into headstands, handstands, you know, all those kind of crazy things. So um, to me, that's what, that's what keeps me going. And that's something you do in the morning because I imagine you have fairly late evenings. Yes, I only do it in the morning. Okay. And everybody that practices yoga will tell you that that's the hardest time to do yoga because your body is the stiffest then. Um, and so when you really get involved in it, uh, you, but you know, it's the only time I've ever practiced. So it's really all I ever know. What does your typical day look like? You probably don't have a typical <clears throat> day, do you? Um, no, I have a very, if, uh, unless I'm traveling for something, I have a really standard kind of uh, day in, in Chicago. Um, I do my yoga and stuff at home in the morning. I go to work at 11, and um, I work until 11 at night. That's my standard day. Um, it's, uh, it, you, when I see, I grew up in the restaurant business, so I'm fourth generation, and, and I, I have always worked nights. Now, the crazy thing is, as a human being, I'm a morning person, so it's really hard for those two things to go together, because I start waking up. I was going to say, what time do you wake up? 5.36 is Which, kind I don't of want to my, ask what time, my time that I start waking up. I don't always get out of bed that early. Rarely do I get out of bed that early, but I start waking up about then. And then um, I usually get out of, my, out of bed by 7 or so. But um, it's, it's crazy because, at, because I am a night, I mean, a, 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 I'm not a night person. I get home at 11 o'clock or like last night was 12 o'clock, and I can be asleep in two minutes. I can literally just like take my clothes off and fall in bed and be asleep. <laughs> oh, that's good. So I wonder about, as we're talking about uh, your evenings and being in the kitchen, and I wonder about your personality in the kitchen and running a restaurant, because I think a lot of people think that chefs have to be really tough, or that's mm -hmm. also another image, as we were talking about the image of like a big chef also being pretty heavy-handed. What's your approach to how you do things? Mm -hmm. There are two approaches to being... Um, that tough guy in the kitchen. Uh, one is the yeller screamer, and the other is the person who very quietly looks you in the eyes and tells you that it needs to be done a certain way. I'm the second one. I'm not a yeller screamer type, but it, you, yes, you do have to have a lot of strength in the kitchen. Um, and I think that once you create 
the atmosphere in a kitchen that is the yelling and screaming thing, you can taste it in the food. Mm -hmm. um, because you will usually have frightened cooks then, not empowered cooks, and it really, it really, it, it, I, I don't know, I, I guess I'm so attuned to things that I can go into a restaurant and I can taste what the atmosphere in the kitchen is based on what, the, what I get on my plate. So I'm not and, gonna ask you to name names, but. Oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going <laughs> there. Well, what is, it, what is it like then, um, how do you know? Uh, there's a certain jangly thing about, yes. You, you, okay, so there's, I, I read this really very interesting review of a restaurant in Mexico City. Um, I think it was in Time Out Mexico City or something like that, and the reviewer said, that she could taste the, it, it's connect, this restaurant is, is really sort of avant-garde, but it's connected to a cooking school. So you wouldn't think that those two things would sort of go together, but they do at this one place. And she said that what she could taste was more of a, a sense of memorization than understanding. And I have to say that you, you if, just think about restaurants that you've been to. Sometimes everything looks precise on the plate, and yet you taste it and it didn't seem like the cook really understood what they were doing. And I, I think that in a Yeller Screamer kitchen, oftentimes there's more of a sense of memorization because you don't want to get yelled at than actually putting yourself out on that plate. Um, to me, the, I want every one of my cooks to not only understand the dish, but actually express themselves through that dish. Now, sometimes you can understand that um, a, a chef has a vision, <laughs> and if your cook doesn't share that vision, <laughs> then what goes out on the plate may not ex be exactly what I'm looking for. So um, I have to be flexible enough to be able to understand what I do as a creative endeavor, and that sometimes the expression may be slightly different because that cook is really expressing himself or herself on that plate as well. And so we, we work, yes, we, it's got to fall within the realm of my vision if it's going to be served in our restaurant. But that doesn't mean that it has to all come from me. And we do a lot of our development work, all of the new menus and everything, are sort of led by one person. Somebody like one of the chefs may take charge of a menu. Um, but then lots of people are throwing out ideas. Um, I never think that creativity should, should be a group effort because oftentimes when you get into um, something where everybody has to be pleased, you've probably all been involved in these kinds of things where it's, um, you're, you're going to be creative by committee, and then nobody's happy. Nobody's happy at all because creativity really has to be sort of a, an expression. So what we do is one person takes the lead, that's the creative force behind it all, but everybody else is throwing ideas out. So your idea may be worked into somebody else's dish, and I find that that's the best way to work in that sort of creative realm because everyone else is invested in the creative process. And they can be invested in somebody else's creative process, giving them something, giving them the, the strength, the ideas, the, the background that they may need. Do you think that's easier now? Do you think as we started talking about flexibility and balance, do you think that that's something that's easier for you to do now? It's almost like having to let go a little bit than maybe what you would have done when you were first starting out? Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> it's still hard, though. <laughs> it's still hard because there are times when um, I will be tasting a dish with my wife because we eat in our restaurant 10 meals a, a week, and I'll be tasting a dish, and... I know my wife is looking at it going, it's like, that's not really you, but I had to give a chef a certain amount of leeway to work on something. There's um, a certain amount of buoying up, and there's a certain amount of um, you have to jump off that cliff yourself and see that it didn't quite work or that maybe this dish could be made better. Of course, I'm always coaching and, and training and all that sort of stuff, but um, it's, it's probably the hardest thing in my, in my world. Um, it's really, really wonderful, and you always dream of, you know, the young chef coming up that shares your vision and basically is your clone, but I haven't found it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have maybe longer yoga times in the morning? Right. <laughs> there are times. Yes, there are times when that happens. So how do you, I wonder how you do that, though. How do you encourage, because it is this notion of you have sort of almost like a, a canvas, right, and you have an outline that you want, but then there's different colors in there. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you, foster that conversation in the kitchen that 
get something that everyone's happy with. Well, you have to know yourself really well. I have to know myself really well. Because what I have to share is not, is, is the vision, for sure, but the vision actually comes from, um, is, is inspired by many different things. So I have to share that inspiration. And I have to be able to communicate that. That's probably the hardest thing to do, is like, where, where, where do I come from? What, what, what? Why did, when I went to Mexico when I was 14 years old, did it immediately resonate with me and I felt like I had come home? What was it about that experience that cemented my relationship with that culture? And then it just grew over the years. And then as it grew and I became more under, well, I understood better the culture and certainly the cuisine and so forth. Why did it evolve the way that it did? Why is my food more influenced by the cooking in, in southern Mexico than in northern Mexico? I know people are always saying to me, it's like, you've never done, in your television show, you've never done northern Mexico at all. And why in your books do you never mention our favorite, favorite specialties in northern Mexico or whatever? It's because the southern part of Mexico and the cuisine there is what resonates with me. That's all I can say. Um, when I got to Oaxaca, say, it, it was like, oh my God, this is where I belong. <laughs> this, is, this is my place. And so I really focused on that, and you still look at our menus, that yes, we have smatterings of things from other places in Mexico, or in, influenced or inspired by things from other places, but at my heart, I, I cook like a Oaxaqueño. So when you're looking for chefs, how do you, I wonder how you, what the interview process is like, or, or is it more important to look <laughs> at how they're cooking? Is that a bigger part it's, of the it's interview? It's hilarious that you ask that because we have this conversation. We're 26 years old now, and we have this conversation at least once a week. It's like, how do you interview somebody to really get to <laughs> know them wondering. and all that sort well, of stuff? Well, but to have everything that you're talking <clears throat> about that you want as well. And that's really hard because most of those cooks coming out, even ones of Mexican-American heritage, when they come out of culinary school, they, they, they don't know very much about the kinds of food that we do because many of them haven't ever really explored it in any great depth. When you look at the curriculum in a culinary school, school, there is so little given, I think, that like Culinary Institute of America, the biggest and most well-respected of the culinary schools in the country, uh, when you look at what they give to Latin America, I think they do all of Latin America in two weeks. And you think out of two years of study, that's all you get. Now, that's not just doing Mexican food. That's doing Mexico and Peru and Argentina and Brazil and all the other countries in between. That's tough. So um, I have to basically, I can't, when I audition a cook, I can't like tell, ask them to cook in our style. Some of them try and they can get kind of close, but it takes a really long time to gain the knowledge well, from the inside, the, the real understanding of the cuisine that we do. So typically, I look for somebody that resonates with the flavors, and then somebody who has the technical skill that we're looking for, and then I put them in the kitchen. They have to be able to, well, they have to have the right personality because as we started this conversation, they can't be yellers and they screamers, can't be yellers and screamers okay. because they'll get kicked out of our kitchen right away. Nobody will support them. Um, so you have to have the right personality to get along with our crew. And we are building a team and like a family. We're not just building uh, people to, that have to work together because they have certain technical skills. We're building a, a family. Again, I want that flavor, that family flavor to come through on the plates. And I know this sounds sort of woo-woo and, and out there, but I, I can taste it. And I can taste which cooks, when there are certain cooks on our, our staff that are so dedicated to the family of Frontera that you can taste it on their plates. And so I, I, I love to see that. So the, you have to be able to fit into our family, or hopefully we've determined that you could fit in. And then you have to have the technical skills. And then when, all I want to do is I want to see you cook. I want to see you touch food. Because <laughs> I, I can tell when a, a chef touches food, whether he loves his profession or whether it's man over beast kind of thing, you know? There's the, there's the well, you, you all probably are, are aware that when you go to culinary school, the curriculum has all been based on um, this European model that basically started with Escoffier back at the turn of the last century, actually codifying haute cuisine, fine dining. Okay, he did that. And it, up to that point, there really wasn't a sort of notion of fine dining, high level cuisines. Everything was much more like private homes and inns and stuff like that. But once he established that, then we had to have a training 
uh, ground for doing that. That became the culinary schools and the, well, uh, early on as pre apprenticeship programs where you had to learn every word, every recipe, everything that was written by Escoffier, his big book. Well, that's where we come from today. That perspective, just so that everybody's aware of it, is really man over beast or man over nature. And basically what you're doing is saying as a cook, I can chop, dice, force, you know, do whatever I have to do to these ingredients to make them look, into, look like something that I am proud to say I created. Now, that's the flip side of that would be the cooking in, in Italy or the cooking in Mexico, which is a lot about letting nature shine forth in that kind of cooking. So instead of all the mousses and galantines and you know all the crazy towers of stuff that people were making in French food, everybody sort of does food that is more horizontal <laughs> and, more, um, and, and more natural looking at the ingredients and making sure that you can identify the ingredients that are on the plate. So when I see a cook that's auditioning for us, touch food, I know w whether that's a loving touch or a forceful touch. And if it's a loving touch, he probably belongs in our kitchen. And it's really fascinating to me um, that it, 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 you, this really happens a lot with, um, with meat. <laughs> I don't know why this is, but you can see a, a chef touch a piece of raw meat. I, this may be not what you want to hear on Sunday morning, but anyway, it's like... <laughs> no, tell us. It's we like I, 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 I tend my wife's be kicking me under the table right now. Okay, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, this is not a problem. But when you see a, 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 a chef touch a piece of raw meat and they basically are just petting it, you know they really, really love that. They really love that. that. And in some ways, it sort of goes to the, that, that moment of, of saying, yes, we're eating meat, so somebody had to kill this thing, but I appreciate this, I respect this, I love it. And I'm sure it happens with all kinds of other non-meat related things, but to me, that's the one that I always resonate with is when I see somebody sort of caress a piece of raw meat. So I want to talk about that the meat. That sounds really kinky, but I didn't <laughs> intend it to be that way. I want to talk about the meat in a minute, but I want to go back to something you were saying about just the style in Escoffier, and what was the style that you grew up with? And how much of, I'm just curious what your, how much of that, what you're talking about, what you like now, or what you want to be now, or what you are now, is what you learned. That's, it's a fascinating question, because I came from all kinds of different backgrounds. Um, oh, first of all, um, I grew up in a family that, of restaurant people. And as I said, I'm fourth generation in a family. My great grandparents, they opened the first grocery stores in the state of Oklahoma. That's where I grew up. And then the next generation had diners. And then when drive ins started back in the 50s, they opened drive ins, uh, they had steak houses. They had lunch counters. My parents had a barbecue restaurant for 37 years. So I grew up, um, which is one of the reasons that I so resonate with a lot of the cuisine of Mexico, because it's live fire cooking. It's like charring stuff. Uh, there's all this real gutsy aspect to it. Mexican cuisine balances acid and um, sweet in a lot of dishes, or spicy and acid and sweet. And if you think about what barbecue sauce is, that's, all, that's really what it is. And barbecue sauce, although we don't really think about it, is really just a sort of sweet and tangy chili sauce. And that's what I grew up with. So when I got to Mexico, there's less sweet in it there, but the food just resonated so much with me. But I was always, I always loved the restaurant business. I love the hospitality industry. I worked every position from dishwasher to busboy to cook in my parents' restaurant. And then my father died when I was in high school. And in high school, I took over the catering business because it was part time. How old and were you? 16. And so I, I would go and do these parties, which were all buffet kind of parties, as they would be for a barbecue restaurant where you're putting everything out and people are helping themselves, casual catering. But I loved that. And I loved throwing parties. I've always loved throwing parties. So that I, I did that. I stayed at home for undergraduate and uh, worked all the way through. I loved the restaurant business. I just so spent all my So what was your undergraduate time. major? 
uh, Spanish language literature and Latin American studies. I had fallen so in love with Mexico that I decided to, to go that route. Then I realized that at some point, if I stuck around with all of that, that I was going to inherit the family business. And I knew at that early age that was completely wrong for me. So I decided to switch gears to completely and go into academics. So I went to graduate school in anthropology and linguistics. And I was going to put that all behind me, except for the fact that I was in this amazing department that had all these really good cooks. And we none of us had any money at all. So every week, we, all would, we would cook for the whole group. So every four or six weeks, whatever it was, it would be your time to host at your apartment, everybody. And we would cook for a whole week. The, whoever was hosting would cook for a whole week. And then remember, this is back in the 70s. And every, it's Julia Child is like huge, and Marcella has on, and all those first writers about great cuisine and we read their books and we were I mean we were academics so we were <laughs> we would we would study 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 and we would go search out all the ingredients this was in Ann Arbor Michigan I was at University of Michigan anyway it was just totally fun to be able to do that and then all of a sudden I realized I was spending a whole I had gone through all of my coursework for a PhD taken my tests and I was spending all my time cooking I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get away from it. I, I had sort of started teaching some cooking classes and with somebody that was in the same school that I was teaching in, we started a catering business and I was like, oh my gosh, I am never gonna get this dissertation finished because I would spend you know, 40 hours a week cooking and 10 hours a week, oh, it should have been the reverse, working on my dissertation. And um, finally, I said, I'm going to take the year off, OK? <laughs> so How many years ago I was that? Like, I took a year <laughs> off that ended up the rest of my life. And uh, so I decided I was just going to see what it was like to do food full time. And I never turned back from that, which was a, a right thing for me because I had really transitioned into it in, in the right way. And I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now without all of my, my graduate school stuff. What was your dissertation on? Uh, oh, an arcane topic that nobody wants to even know about. It was crazy, because I was really in the anthropological side of linguistics, so it's like, how do you communicate things in, uh, oh, you know, we can't even go there. It, <laughs> it was so, it, it was the kind of dissertation that somebody would have, like my committee would have read and immediately wanted to recycle, you know, because it's like, we'll never go back to this, this thing again. But I didn't really have to go too deeply into it. So during that time when I started teaching cooking, I literally cooked every single, oh, I had started this early on, um, during high school, I used to do all these French dinners for my family, which I, they poor people, they had to suffer through this. But when, when, I, was, um, when I was 12 years old, my brother, um, probably a lot of you know because he's on TV every day and ESPN, he did nothing but sports, okay? So he got, he played every sport and he got all the equipment. My, my parents would buy him all the equipment. I am not a sports guy at all. I didn't go, I never played a single sport. And so I got really mad one fall when he was getting all of his football gear and all that kind of stuff. And I said, I want Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volume 1. And <laughs> this is, I said, you just spent all that money on all of his equipment. I want you to spend this money on this book, because it was like $25, you know, 100 years ago. So it was super expensive. And um, so they really didn't have a, any, any leg to stand on, so they bought it for me. And I started making these French dinners out of, now that's a really complex and hard book. When you were that 12. I loved. When I started when I was 12 but I continued all the way through high school. So I had done so much of that and I started cooking and I, I really schooled myself in all of that French technique, all that stuff that I was sort of decrying as sort of man over beast type of cooking. Um, it, I, I learned to do it all and I really studied hard. There were no schools that I could really go to back then to do it, so I just educated myself. Then I started, and most people don't know this, I started my professional cooking career as a pastry chef doing French pastries. And I loved pastries. I still love pastries. I cook them on the weekends all the time. Um, the French pastry school here is uh, one of the owners uh, is the chef Jackie Pfeiffer. And he's just coming out with a book um, that is a really great book when it comes out. If you're into pastries, man, get it. Because he has distilled in there 
like 20 years of his knowledge of teaching young cooks how to make all this really complicated stuff, what's the easiest and best way to teach it? So I just got the galleys of it, and I'm reading it like, I, it's like candy to me. I mean, I was like reading every, book, every page of it, because I go back into that aspect, and I really respect and love that, but that really wasn't the kind of cooking that I needed. So then I, I transitioned to Mexico, and I decided, um, I, I got a break when I was teaching cooking in Ann Arbor, and uh, I got to do a series of 26 shows for public television, um, all on the cu cuisine of Mexico. It was back in the days when it, there was not a glut, there was no food network. The only place you could find a cooking show was on public television. This was hosted by just a local uh, channel, actually, Bowling Green State University down in, in Illinois, just, uh, I mean, down in Ohio, just south of Toledo. And I went down there and we, we shot it, no budget at all, basically. But man, that taught me so much. And what they gave was that? me, oh, you, 78, <laughs> it's a long, long, long time ago. And, but it taught me so much and they gave me a, a, a thousand bucks to go to Mexico. And so I didn't get paid for the shows, but I got a thousand bucks to go to Mexico. And that was my first real serious research trip into the cuisines of Mexico. I had lived there before, but I was a student. I was just studying anthropology kind of things. But um, the, I, I really, I started then on this path to educate myself about Mexico because I had done it with the, the sort of the French pastries and French traditional cuisine, and I decided to really do that with Mexico. So then, uh, we, my, right about that same time, my wife and I got married, and uh, we we saved every penny, and we decided we were going to go and live in Mexico for a year, and I was going to write a book. And that was gonna, I was going to do it all in one year, and we were going to travel all over the country. So we got to Mexico, and I realized that it wasn't a year. Um, it was going to take years and years and years to do what I wanted to do. So we got a part-time job that we could go back and forth to the States, and we lived in Mexico uh, for five years, basically. And we went to every state. We cooked with local cooks and all. Out of all of that came my first book. That's my PhD dissertation, because I did it as, I did it just like I was doing a PhD dissertation. I have reams, I have volumes of every item that we found in every market in every section of Mexico, what were, what were the cooks cooking in the little stalls around the place, all that. I really did it like a PhD dissertation. And out of it, I wrote, um, for a general audience, a book that was a real clear and well-researched snapshot of what cooking was like in the, mid, the early 80s in Mexico, all over the whole country. So Rick, let's go back to man over beast yeah. and the meat and ask, I want to ask you a question about sustainability and meat yeah. and how that's possible. And I think there are probably people who would say that even using meat in itself is not right. sustainable. So I wonder your thoughts on that. Well, I'm, I'm really into talking about sustainability. You know, our, um, I think in my introduction, you all heard that we have a foundation that supports local farmers. Um, and we do that because I don't believe that you can build great, uh, uh, a great local cuisine. Certainly can't have great restaurants unless there's great local agriculture. When we opened uh, Frontera in 87, there were no farmer's markets in the city of Chicago and no farms that we could buy, for, buy with. Now, you just think at a quarter of a century later, it is 180 degree, degrees from there, but it's because I and so many other chefs said, we want to create the supply chain, and then we realized that the young farmers didn't have the money to do it, so we started this foundation so that we could give them capital improvement grants so they could get the hoop houses and tractors and watering systems or whatever it is that they needed. And so we've, we've really built that all up. And we only support ones that are moving towards sustainability. They don't have to be certified organic, though probably that's the, the ultimate result, uh, the goal for us. But when we talk about sustainability, um, we in our restaurant are always looking at it from sort of a, a three different aspects. Um, so we look at sustainability in terms of how was that food stuff grown or produced, and you have to look at it in every aspect. And then we look, about, look at sustainability in terms of our restaurant family. How do we treat each other? Are we a good place to work? Is it sustainable to work here for a long period of time? And then we look at our community. And are we 
contributing in a positive way to our, our community. So then we think about things like how do we deal with our trash and how do we support other organizations and all that sort of stuff. So we're really looking at the full aspect of sustainability. Now, if we take sort of that laser look at something like meat, we have to also look at that in the terms of the bigger picture, all those other things that we were talking about. And right now, we're at a sort of weird juncture in the history of food in this country. We've got the Anthony Bourdains and the David Changs and the, 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 the young, um, I think for better or worse, FU chefs. You know, they're just out there doing what they're doing and they're, they're gonna like just laud the, the great big animals and the carcasses and the, at the big, the mad conference in Copenhagen this last year, somebody actually slaughtered a chicken on stage in front of everybody. And so it's like, there's a lot of that sort of in your face. Um, we're gonna take you back to the roots of your cuisine. And it's sort of, uh, I think it's kind of hilarious that the paleo diet is going on at the same time as all these chefs because they're sort of acting out that Neanderthal character in a lot of ways of what's going on out there. and then then you, you say, okay, well, at least they're bringing us face to face that the chicken doesn't come in a little package that's got saran wrap over the top of it, you know? It's that you actually are killing an animal here. And then you start asking, you start going back and back and back, and what is it? Is it sustainable? I think that a lot of people will tell us these days that we, for many reasons, eat too much meat, plain and simple. So, that's not sustainable from a production standpoint because it's not good for the environment and it's not good for us as human beings to consume that meat because it's not as healthy. So if we're going to step back and look at that sustainability stuff, we are going, we can say, and there are the people that say, we should just cut out all meat from our diet. Well, I think that that only just makes enemies, basically. I think what we can say is, what if we start curtailing it, or like Mark Bittman does, probably a lot of you follow his stuff in the New York Times, and um, you know, and he wrote this recent book, and it's sort of like, I, I think it's called Vegan One Day. Vegan by Day? Vegan, is it by well, he does Vegan by Day, or Vegan One Day a Week, or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. I love that. Man, that just, first of all, it gets me to eat different things, and to me, that's really exciting. So you start thinking about, if I were to be vegan by day, what would my, my world look like? And then you start to lose your taste for just having meat because you're so excited about some of the other things that you've just added to your diet. And that's like, wow, this is, I'm certainly blossoming out here. Certainly as restaurant chefs, we can create dishes that are so exciting that have very little meat in them. But we have to, we have to, they have to be compelling <laughs> because you folks have to come to our restaurants and you may have sat down and go, this is a celebration meal. I'm thinking I'm going to have that steak, but this other dish looks so good. Well, it may have half the amount of meat in it, but I have to seduce you into ordering that other dish. And we work a lot with that in our restaurant. How do we do that? How do we make the dish with not the meat? But the dish be just as exciting as the steak thing that's really all about the meat. So I think what we're going to see is that meat's not sustainable for us the way that we're eating it now, in our, for our health or for the planet. And we are going to see a lot of chefs helping us and cookbook authors and all that sort of stuff help us to transition into a better balance. Are we going to give up meat? No, we're not going to give up meat. It's super delicious, and we're going to find out that there's, there's places that we can... We, well, first of all, we're going to have to understand <laughs> that good meat is really expensive, mm -hmm. just the way that we found out that good fish, wild-caught fish, is really expensive. Now, you can get trash versions of both of those things that you, I guess you can try to convince yourself are good for you, but basically they're not very good for you. And... So as we transition into an understanding of, you know, we don't have to eat that much meat, we might be willing to pay for the better meat because we're using less of it. And to me, that's where we're headed, and that's where we all, ha we all have to sort of take steps in that direction, and we're not going to take them fast. And that's why I never listen to people that say, we should stop all meat right now and all that kind of stuff, because it's just not going to happen. Plus, I love it. You love it. We, we, as, 
As human beings, most of us really love meat. We just don't have to eat as much of it as we're eating right now. You and I could talk. I was like, we could stay up here forever and we talk, could. but I want to leave <laughs> room for time for questions for you all. Yes. Um, one last question before we get to your questions. Yes. There will be people circulating with mics, so get your questions ready. Um, obviously, such sad news this week uh, for not just Chicago, but the food world with Charlie Trotter's death. And yeah. I, was, um, I was noticing a Chicago Tribune uh, online gallery that had you and your wife at yeah. his restaurant a yeah. long time ago, and I was thinking of, I wonder, first of all, if it, um, your thoughts on the arc of his career and if it's made you think this week about your legacy as well. Oh my gosh, it's, um, I, I find it just a, it's been a pall over me all week long. First of all, it's an untimely death, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Charlie was so important in the history of restaurants in the United States, not just in Chicago. Um, oftentimes, you know, we, you can't see somebody very clearly that, that's right next to you, you know, that kind of stuff. You actually have to listen to what people outside of your town are saying. Um, but uh, he was so influential. And uh, when he decided to close the restaurant, I think I and so many of us were anxious to see what was going to come next, to see what kind of passion and vision he was going to bring to another project. I mean, he's a young guy. So when, when the announcement of his death came and we all went like, oh my God, not, he, no, it can't be. He can't be taken from us at this early age. Immediately I thought, oh, we are not going to get to see what the next stage of his career was. When you think of, um, we started at the same time, um, the, w you know, we started at the same time, like months apart. Uh, we opened in March, he opened in August. And the, and we used to go there really regularly because it was um, not the, it was not the temple of gastronomy that it was later on. It was just a restaurant you could kind of pop into. And it was a a la carte menu and you could eat there. And I just remember very early on saying to Charlie, you have to raise your prices. This food is, uh, this is really, I didn't say that later in his life. Uh, but, it was like, <laughs> but early on, I, was, I remember, it's like I was eating something that was like $14, an entree that was $14 on the menu. It's like, you can't, you can't make, uh, and he's, no, no, it's like, I know what I'm doing. I'm just going to sort of get, get my crowd, and then we'll inch up from that. Um, but then there was a moment sort of in the early, I mean, just three or four years into it, when he had obviously become known for doing this really amazing cuisine with a great vision. And then he went to all tasting menus, small portions, multi-course multi, uh, tasting menus. Well, we all think of that now as what you get when you go to those kinds of restaurants, but we hadn't seen that before. That was really a, a Charlie innovation. And then um, the, right after that, it became that, that he was gonna do an all vegetable one. Well, that was back in the days when, when you said you were going to eat vegetarian food, it meant that you got the steamed vegetables on their plate. I mean, honestly, that or a salad, that's kind of what a restaurant would give you. Then it kind of went to veggie burgers. But I have to say that when he said he was going to do an all-vegetable menu, he was saying vegetables matter. Now we live in the era of the farmer's market. We talk about vegetables. Meat consumption is going down. Vegetable consumption is going up. This is like, I don't know, 15, 20 years after he made that first step in that direction. Talk about vision to be able to see that, that what we needed to be talking about was more vegetables than anything else was really, really remarkable. He started a collection, doing a collection of books and um, maybe some of you own or have seen those books. Um, they're more manuals than they are um, cookbooks that you would really cook from, certainly in your house. They require way too many people and products and, and time and all that kind of stuff. So it, they're, but he started basically documenting all of that innovation that he was doing. And back in those days, there was nowhere young chefs could go to learn that stuff. They weren't teaching it in any cooking schools. 
And so those books became the Bibles for so many of the chefs that were coming up. You know, he was in his 40s, they were in their 20s, and they were going over every word in there. They were learning all of that sort of stuff. Now we, we expect every, every great chef to come out with their, their book that shows you the inside of what their restaurant is, is, is operating like. But he was the real first one to do that kind of thing. Uh, and so, and, and I, I think, Probably a lot of people here are aware of that. He, he, um, yes, he had a, he had a big ego. He, he, he was that kind of guy that he knew he was doing something special, and he let that be out there and be known. And, and you can't do the stuff that he did and be a mousy guy in the back, okay? But he was so incredibly generous that. I have to say, you know, he, he would host all these chefs from all over the world. He could get them to come here to Chicago. He could get Fran Adria from El Bouy to come here. He could get Heston Blumenthal from Fat Duck to come here. Pierre Hermé, the best pastry chef in Paris. All of these chefs, they all came from all over the world. And he would host them for these special dinners every five years or ten years, whatever it was. But he would make sure those chefs got to other places around Chicago. So that's how we got to cook for all of those guys, because he would make sure that they all came to our restaurant while they were here. Mm -hmm. And that kind of generosity is, um, I, 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 feel, I feel a huge debt of gratitude for him doing that, for him sharing Chicago with the world in that way. And the, I was talking to our, I mean, oh, we've been talking about this nonstop all week long at work, because. You know, our pastry chef worked at Trotter's, and our, our sommelier did all of her work for uh, taking the master sommelier test at his restaurant, with, uh, hosted every week. She would go to the tasting there with all these sommeliers from around town. He was so incredibly generous to host these things. He really wanted to be that rising tide, because he knew that, that all the boats would rise with that. And so um, I think we all owe him an incredible debt of gratitude, and it's just a super sad moment mm -hmm. that we have to be talking about this right now in this way, because it's not the right moment for it, I don't think. It's, it was a very untimely mm -hmm. uh, death. So I think there are some folks on the floor who have microphones. And if you're up here, there are some microphones up here as well that you can go to. So and if you can just make sure you do use the microphone because we are recording. So just make for sure the microphone gets to you. And if you can stand up, please, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm from Mexico. Yes. I just came to live here to the United States this past summer. And I've been watching you, your shows. And I really want to thank you for honoring the Mexican cuisine. I found fascinating that you even use some of the methods that my grandma and my mom use when cooking. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, I can see that you not only understand the Mexican culture by your cooking, but you're embracing it. So my question is, what have you learned from the Mexican culture mm -hmm. that now I can find in your person, in yourself? as a father, as a friend, as a husband, as a leader, what, what's like that uh, Mexican Ricardo that now I can find in you? Thank you, thank you for, ask, for, thank you for your comments and for asking that question. I got close to answering it early on when I was talking, um, but I can go back and say very specifically, um, it's all about generosity of spirit and love for family as not just in this in our country we tend to think of family as you know me and my daughter and my wife maybe you know the next little group out but in mexico family is family <laughs> it's the uh, it's it, it just spills over into community and what i fell in love with first in mexico was generosity of spirit when i was 14 i took that first trip there and people everywhere i went people were I would sh spark to something, and somebody would say, oh, here, taste it. Here, experience it. Let's, let, let us take you to this place. People were inviting us into their homes. People were just so open and friendly. And when people travel from the US to Mexico, 
this is what we hear the most. Well, not necessarily if you only go to Cancun or Puerto Vallarta or someplace like that. <laughs> Although I even hear it from people that go to Puerto Vallarta, not so much Cancun. But that people, are, that everywhere you go, that somebody is just being generous <laughs> with you. It's like, I'm a human being, you're a human being, and I'm going to share... I'm going to share my world with you. And there's a sense of, you know, it's the land of fiesta. And if I could say anything we talk about in our world of the, the world that I live in, that we're in the hospitality industry. If you want to know what hospitality is, you go to Mexico. <laughs> That's true hospitality. And when we're if at the core of fiesta, which is one of the things that bugs me the most in the U.S., because people say they're going to do a Mexican fiesta, and especially around um, Cinco de Mayo, people are all, I say, I, I, my books get used a lot around Cinco de Mayo. And as a, <laughs> they pull those books off, and they start thinking about having their Mexican fiesta. And the first thing that they think about is sort of drunken debauchery and uh, serapes and sombreros and uh, guacamole and fajitas and nachos, I guess. And so it's like all of a sudden, it, that sense of fiesta has lost the whole true heart of fiesta because fiesta is just opening up your love for life and sharing it with other people. And it's not so much about the, the drinking and that sort of stuff as it is about just loving people. You go to a three-day fandango in Oaxaca for somebody's wedding and there is just such a joy for life that you experience for all of those days. And it can go on for dancing for hours or whatever. It's just that kind of love for life is what I hopefully, it certainly has changed my life and it's what I, I try to share with all those around me. Yes, uh, I should start with a testimonial. As somebody who knows someone who works at your restaurant, and has absolutely lovely things to say about you. So I must state you're not just a great chef, but a great owner and a great uh, employer uh, based on somebody I know for many years. So I'll ask a question now. Uh, in an era where food has become so important, where it comes from, and what kind of food is we are consuming, and you're doing a great work you know, promoting uh, farmers markets, but are all of you chefs working together where you can have impact not just in a local region but in national policy? You know, we have obesity in this country that's completely out of control. We are consuming foods which we don't even know what they contain. So I think all of you, where you have such a large audience, you can work together to promote really healthy eating throughout the country and promote really good farming techniques, not just locally but all right. over the country. Um, I, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to address here, and I have to say that I have to be true to, to who I am. I understand that your, your question, your concern, um, your admonition in all of that, I, uh, I, and I have a bunch of chef friends that go down that path. That path is just simply not right for me. I'll support all of everybody that wants to go down that path, and I'll do anything that I can. You know, I, I have to cook food for people. I have to, that's, that's my strength. And I think um, if I can contribute anything to that path, it will be in getting people so excited about the food first <laughs> that they then go down that path. And that's the thing that's right for me. I want to be the person that seduces every person in this audience into tasting food like they've never tasted it before and saying, oh my God, we have to support you know, these organic farmers and the, these people that are doing humane animal husbandry because what they're giving us is so full of life. It so enriches our lives that we have to, we have to support that. That's what I can do best, and so that's where I am. But I, I have lots of friends that work in policy, and I support them as absolute much as I can. Am I going to be the guy on the front line? That's just not me. So I have to, but I thank you for your concern. That's who you um, Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know, I wonder why they put this session at 11 o'clock, and then we all leave here, and we're absolutely starving. I know. I was so like, oh, these poor restaurants around here yeah. are going to get inundated with ravenous <laughs> folks. 
So my question to you is, what's next? Oh, what's um, next? You have so many wonderful restaurants already here, and so what's next? What are the new flavors we're going to get? Yeah, um, oh, we need to talk about Cascabel. Oh, so we didn't thing, talk about Cascabel, we so we can, we can well. do that. Okay, so, um, so I, I love writing books. I'm always writing a book, and so I'm, I'm right in the middle of, a, of another one. Um, and I love to be able, it kind of goes back to this whole thing, is that people need um, a blueprint, a manual, to be able to utilize all the stuff that is good. And so I can help them by, by writing books. You'll notice that 100% um, of my books are all written to people that are cooking at home. I don't, we have never written a book that really reflects what we do at the, at the restaurant. I always write for home cooks because I want to be able to enrich your life with the things that I have learned from work, but I want to translate them into something that you can do. Uh, more TV, we're going to do uh, the 10th season, if you can believe that. 10th season of Mexico One Plate at a Time is going to be um, all focused on Mexico City, and this is going to be a really fascinating thing because I've chosen 13 chefs, I just do 13 shows a year, but I'm chosen 13 chefs, and you're going to actually see the see Mexico City from, not from my perspective, but from their perspective. They're going to take us into what has formed them as chefs, and you will get a chance to see that. The Mexico City chefs, the restaurant scene there is hotter than it's ever been. It's just astonishing. And there's all these young chefs. And I want them to share their stories with you. And to cook with their grandmothers, if that's the grandmother that, that in fact affected who they are or influenced who they are, that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a great series of shows. Um, we probably, a lot of people have heard that... Um, we are going to be doing uh, the Shoko, which is our quick service place downtown that focuses on Carlos, the meal in a bowl soups and tortas. Is uh, We're going to do one um, in Wicker Park. We're going to do a neighborhood version of that that will open up sometime in the spring. Um, so that's, that's kind of coming for us. What we're super excited about is the, the, we've been so successful. We've broken the mold of food service at the airport. So we are... Yes. <laughs> we, I am very grateful to you for We now <laughs> have given you real food in the, in the airport, and uh, it'll be, it's really nice to be able to do that. And it's all local product, and, and it's all made to order. So we're real happy about that. Um, and then Casca Bell, um, I'm, I have oftentimes talked about food as having a transformative effect on us. And sometimes it's just a dish, but sometimes it's about a meal. And um, I have been in so many meals in my life that I came out of that meal knowing I was a changed person. And it had to do with people, and it had to do with me being open, and food, and the love of the cook, and you know all of this stuff coming together. And, we're in such a drive-through culture that people don't even eat with people all that much anymore. And I wanted to come back and share my commitment to the table and its transform transformative effect um, with people. And I am a huge theater guy. I think a lot of you guys know that. But I, I support Chicago theater and theater across the United States. And I love live theater because it's very much like what I do for a living. Well, I have to make food and then you have to eat that food. And I can't do, I, I can't tape record that or anything and make it work for you guys. So um, I like theater because you have, it's real live, live people doing something for you. And you're, oftentimes leave the theater a changed person. So I, we created, I created with Looking Glass Theater Company the um, this story of a meal. But instead of just talking about the meal, everybody got a chance to eat the meal that was in the audience because it was set in a boarding house and everybody was seated at boarding house tables. And this is about a transformative effect of a meal. I made the meal that the actors ate and then we had this sort of tiny galley kitchen that made the food that everybody else got. But we all ate that food together. And the people were, it was told in the method of, ma or the, the style of magical realism. And so the, when the actors would have, the, when the food would touch them in a certain way, they didn't go, oh, wow. They did other things. And so, so how many of you were able to see Casca Bell when it was, a lot of you, we were there. And so you noticed that their reactions were, um, say, superhuman reactions, but that created 
an opportunity for you to go, well, what does this food do to me? And am I having that same kind of reaction? So yes, it's the story of a meal. And uh, we were so super successful with it. And you can imagine with my schedule, I can only do really short runs. So we did a five-week run. We're going to be remounting that um, this next summer. Um, it will be um, not at Looking Glass. That space was already committed. And so we're going to be doing it at the small theater, at o the Owen Theater at the Goodman. And um, so we'll do another five weeks of it. Um, I'll just say, if anybody is intrigued by this, um, follow that through the Looking Glass um, website uh, because it sold out the day it opened. Um, and so we didn't, basically, once the reviews came out, all the tickets had already been purchased anyway. So um, it was a really, really remarkable thing to be able to take food. We always talk about what we do in the restaurant is very theatrical. But then I flipped that, and I took the restaurant into the theater, because then that, that changes things. And so your expectations are really different. And I think we were very successful in opening people up to looking at food in its full, sensual power. I think we have time for one more question, one if more we're brief question. about it. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yep. Just wanted to ask, is there any kind of a, a central theme, or um, you know, what's the secret of, of mole? <laughs> Great. <laughs> 30 seconds. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, okay, so this is a, this is a very true. Um, when we opened our restaurant, um, I, I told you folks that I love Oaxaca, and I've gone to Oaxaca since I was young. And um, we, we opened our restaurant, and um, I wouldn't put Oaxacan black mole on the menu because I never thought I could make it. I could never make it good enough. I could never make it up to the level that if one of the Oaxacan grandmothers walked in the door, she could taste it and say, it was okay. I mean, she would never say it was great, okay, because hers would be the best, and her family would say that too, and I trust that and respect it. But she, I wanted to be able, that a Oaxacan could come in there and go, this is, this is a credible Oaxacan black mole. And it, it utilizes techniques that are not utilized anywhere in the world in cooking, basically, and it's so, it's so uniquely its own thing. I worked 10 years, 10 years, and you're asking me in one minute <laughs> to summarize all of that 10 years of work, but I have to say, it's um, the, the thing about, uh, to go back to what our first question uh, asker was uh, saying, you know, I am the person that, and maybe this comes from my love for culture and my deep history in anthropology, but I learned to make uh, mole, Oaxacan, black mole, but also mole poblano and the other moles that are on, that grace our menu as well. I learned to make those from people who had been doing it, not just their lifetimes, but for generations in their family. And yes, they, those sorts of things evolve, but they only evolve around a core of great tradition. And everybody really, in Mexico, there's that great respect for that tradition. And they, you don't have to be able to necessarily say why it's done. You just know that through these generations, something has been perfected. You may not understand it, and I don't think it's necessarily our job always to understand it. It's to respect it, and if you follow it step by step and really give yourself up to it, then you can make it. So that's kind of what, what mole is all about. When, when I first went to Mexico, I was teaching in a cooking school, and, this, this, the, uh, and I thought, you know, I know all this classic French technique. I can go down to Mexico and I can sort of help the cooks along to, you know, to understand what good technique is really all about. And somebody in that cooking school said to me, the only way you'll ever learn anything, and this sort of, we, we hear this a lot these days, is to get the beginner's mind, is to go back and take everything out of your mind and open yourself up to, and to just doing exactly, being in that moment and doing exactly that thing. And that is what I did. <laughs> and that's why when people read my stuff, they can resonate with it if they were raised with Mexican tradition because I respect that part of it. I may try to tell you why I think it works because that's part of my role, I think, as translator. But a lot of times when people make mole, they, they say, oh, I can do this better. I know this will be better if I just do this. I can cut this step out and all that. No, you kind of have to get the beginner's mind. Just go into it and do it. It's been a real pleasure to be with you folks today. Thank you so much for coming.